Hello everyone, this is Brad from iBuyPower. Uh, today we're going to be doing the first of a two-part series on CPU coolers. This part will specifically be about the different types of CPU coolers um, that you have to choose from, what to look for in terms of if you're going to be purchasing a CPU cooler as an upgrade or configuring one on your system, how to properly match um, the type of cooler uh, to your system itself. So a couple of reasons why you might be interested in, uh, you know, different kinds of coolers. Uh, you know, maybe uh, you have uh, one of the lower end coolers and you've upgraded your processor and you need to upgrade your cooling to match the higher end processor. You know, maybe your cooler um, has failed and you're looking to replace it uh, or you've adjusted your uh, workload to, you know, one that requires more CPU usage um, and you need more cooling. Maybe you want a quieter cooler. This guide should help cover you know, a lot of those different scenarios for you. So as you can see here, we have a whole lot of coolers uh, out on the table. Um, there's three major categories of CPU coolers that I wanna go over. Uh, the first one's kind of at the entry level are what we like to call stock coolers or like OEM fans. Um, so these are usually the types of coolers that will come bundled with the processor. If you were to buy a box processor, they're usually gonna be kind of just enough to keep the CPU cool. A lot of higher end CPUs, um, because of their high power usage, can't even use one of these, so they won't come with them, but some of the mid-range CPUs will come with them. Above that, we have what we will call tower coolers. Um, so these are still heat sinks and fan assemblies, but they're a little bit more extensive as far as um, the heat sink area and the amount of cooling potential that they have compared to a stock cooler. Um, so this would be like a 92 millimeter tower fan um, versus a larger 140 millimeter tower fan. Uh, and of course, since this is a larger cooler, it will have more cooling potential. Up next, we have what most people are familiar with, with higher end PCs, and those will be all-in-one liquid coolers. So all-in-one means that the pump and the radiator and coolant and tubing assembly is already pre-assembled all in one unit. It's not something that you have to put together yourself. You just uh, purchase it and install it onto your CPU and you install the radiator into the case. These come in a lot of different sizes. We have uh, the most common sizes here uh, on display. They are usually named after the size of the fan that is um, configured on the radiator. So at the bottom, we have the single fan cooler. So we have a 120 millimeter liquid cooler um, and a 140 millimeter liquid cooler. So like I said, that's gonna be because this uh, cooler's fan is 120 millimeters across. This cooler's fan is 140 millimeters across. And then as you step up to two and three fan configurations of those coolers, you get a 240 cooler for two 120s. You get a uh, 280 cooler for two 140s a 360 cooler for three 120s and a 420 cooler uh, for three 140s. And as you might imagine, the larger the radiator, the more cooling performance you have. It might be pretty easy just to say, okay, well, bigger is better. If I want the best cooling performance, just go with the biggest liquid cooler. But that's not always gonna be the right choice. I mean, you know, as you could imagine, these are much, much more expensive than these, um, but there are also other things that you need to consider when it comes to which cooler to select for your system. So the first of the important considerations you need to take when looking for a cooler for your system is what type of CPU you have and uh, what your workload for that CPU is gonna be. Intel and AMD both have a similar product stack with three, five, seven, nine models. Uh, spanning from casual at the entry level all the way up to ultra enthusiast performance levels. Generally, as you move up the stack, uh, you will need better cooling the higher you go. Your planned workload also makes a big difference. A CPU in a PC used for gaming only will see the CPU usage fluctuate and therefore not spend a lot of time at 100% usage. A PC used for rendering, on the other hand, may have the CPU at 100% usage for hours straight, requiring more substantial cooling. Noise levels are also a concern. Uh, generally speaking, if you want a very quiet PC, you're gonna need to overbuild your system's cooling so that the fans can run slower for the same cooling power. Here's a chart we've made as a general guideline for cooler selection, but we do highly recommend looking up cooler recommendations for your specific processor as the heat output can vary wildly between generations and models. Besides the CPU, you also need to know which socket type your motherboard has because the socket will determine the mounting um, mechanism for the cooler itself. So I'm gonna go over uh, sort of the five most popular recent CPU sockets um, and each of them kind of has a little bit 
you know, different way that the CPU will get mounted to it um, that will affect your choice of cooler. Um, so the first one we have over here is AMD's socket AM4. Uh, so this will be for any of the Ryzen processors from the first generation um, to the 5000 series. So any Ryzen that starts with a one and up to any Ryzen that starts with a five. Um, and then after that, um, AMD transitioned to the AM5 socket. So this is any of the Ryzen 7000 series CPUs. Um, and you can see here, there's a difference uh, in the socket mechanism. So the original AM4 socket uses what is called a pin grid array. So there are pins on the CPU that go down uh, into the CPU socket, whereas AM5 switched to a LAN grid array where the pins are actually in the motherboard. Uh, the nice thing about these two sockets is that the um, stock retention mechanism um, for the CPU cooler is the same. It has the same dimensions. So a lot of CPU coolers that are designed for AM4 uh, will be compatible with AM5, but there are some really, really important distinctions that we will get into later. Uh, moving on, we have the Intel uh, platforms. So on the mainstream side, we have the what is known as the 11.5X socket. So that covers um, a whole bunch of different Intel CPUs all the way back starting at, you know, the second generation of Intel Core up through 11th generation. And then at the 12th generation, they went from the 11.5X um, socket design to the socket 1700. Um, they look very similar, uh, but actually these uh, four holes on the older socket are a little bit closer together um, than on socket 1700. Um, so you will want to make sure that your cooler has a specific bracket to fit socket 1700 um, and doesn't just say something generic like Intel. Um, on the high end, we have uh, what is usually known as the socket 20XX. So this would be for 2011 and 2066. This is Intel's high end platform. It's not as commonly used anymore because the mainstream platforms are much more powerful, um, but there are a lot of them out there. Um, and this again has a completely different um, mounting mechanism uh, compared to the mainstream boards. Um, and we'll get into those in a little bit more detail coming up. So one of the really important considerations, specifically if you are upgrading a or changing a cooler on an AMD motherboard, um, is whether or not your old cooler and your new cooler use the factory retention bracket uh, on the AM4 or AM5 socket. So what I'm talking about is this thing here. Um, this has got a back plate and these two black plastic clips on it. Um, if you normally, this comes pre-installed on the motherboard, um, but some coolers will reuse this. Uh, some coolers will only use the back plate for it uh, and other coolers will go do away with it entirely um, and provide their own mounting kit, including a back plate. Um, so what could end up happening is if your old cooler um, did not use this, um, it could have been tossed out. Uh, and your, if your new cooler does use it, um, you may have to purchase another one of these. Um, this is mostly a issue for socket AM4. Um, if we take a look at the socket AM5 uh, motherboard here, it does have a backplate, but typically it's not removed um, because this backplate actually holds the socket itself onto the motherboard. Um, so not many coolers will remove that. They will tend to reuse these plastic clips or at worst, um, they will reuse the mounting holes through the motherboard and just mount into the holes that these clips normally mounted into. For Intel boards, this isn't as much of an issue um, because the mainstream Intel boards don't have backplates anyways. Pretty much every cooler you come across uh, will provide its own backplate. Um, so like I said, it's not as much of a concern if you're working with an Intel platform. So I'm gonna clean these up um, and then uh, we'll go to the next part of the video where I'll talk about all the rest of the compatibility considerations that you need to take when choosing a new cooler. So we've talked about different types of coolers as well as the different types of motherboard sockets that you may uh, encounter when you need to mount them uh, into your system. Um, there are a few more things to consider uh, in terms of um, compatibility uh, and performance uh, before you go and select that cooler. Um, so the first one is going to be, you know, is the cooler powerful enough? Does it have enough cooling capacity for whatever your use case is? The more powerful CPU you have um, and the longer you are going to run it, um, at or near its maximum CPU usage, uh, the more cooling capacity you will need. One of these tower heat sinks here, um, you know, they're great for a you know, mid-range CPU or for a higher end CPU that maybe you're just doing some gaming on, but if you're going to be doing some kind of like rendering task where you're maxing out that CPU for hours on end, 
um, it may not be enough uh, to cope with the heat that that CPU is going to put out, and you may need to upgrade to either a larger heat sink um, or a liquid cooler. Um, one of the nice things about liquid coolers uh, is that you know they have much much higher heat capacity than most heat sinks do, um, so they're really really great for if you're going to run a higher end CPU for a long period of time, um, they're better at dissipating that heat. Um, but one of the things you do have to think about uh, when it comes to liquid coolers is compatibility with your case. Um, so air coolers also have some compatibility to consider. Um, right here we have one set up to kind of illustrate one of those. Uh, if you'll notice, um, the fan actually sits below the edge of the RAM on this motherboard. For this particular cooler on this particular board, um, there is no conflict. Um, we're just barely, barely up on this RAM here, um, but there are going to be situations where uh, a tower air cooler will interfere with the memory on your motherboard, especially for larger coolers, taller heat sinks. Um, unfortunately, uh, there's not a lot of hard specs. Usually the cooler manufacturers will put up some sort of diagram to show you the dimensions of the cooler, uh, but motherboard manufacturers won't do that. It's a little bit hard to relate one to the other. You kind of have to go by sight, but just know that if you're gonna have tall heat sink RAM, especially RGB uh, RAM, that this is something you will need to consider for an air cooler. Liquid coolers tend not to have that problem because the water block is that's above the CPU is very small, um, and the large portion of the cooler is the radiator, which mounts somewhere else on the case. Um, and that kind of presents another issue where you need to make sure that that radiator can fit somewhere in your case. Um, you know, if you go online and you look up what is the highest performance liquid cooler, you will probably find something like this Arctic Freezer 420. This thing in a lot of reviews is the most powerful liquid cooler that you can buy, but you'll also notice how large it is. Um, if you take a look in relation to this case that we have here, this cooler is actually longer than the case. Um, so, you know, of course this wouldn't be compatible with this system. This is kind of an exaggerated case, uh, but you know, you can run into situations like this um, if you sort of blindly purchase a cooler just based on performance reviews, um, not thinking about compatibility with your case. Another thing to consider um, is the size of the fans on your cooler. Uh, a lot of cases are tend to be designed around either using 120 millimeter fans or using 140 millimeter fans. So if your case already has 120 millimeter fans, especially in the front, um, you know, a lot of cases come equipped with RGB fans, uh, to, you know, for the aesthetic purpose. And if you are going to front mount a liquid cooler, you do want to make sure that you're not going to mess up those aesthetics. So again, you may find that a 280 cooler reviews better, has you know better performance to noise ratio, um, but in terms of maintaining the aesthetic of the system, a 240 millimeter or a 360 millimeter cooler may work out better for you just because you can reuse those same fans. Another consideration um, is um, connectivity. Uh, you know, coolers have to plug in in order to function. So each cooler generally has at least one fan header for the pump and one fan header per fan on the cooler. So that means for a cooler like this that has one pump and two fans, you're going to have to plug in three fan headers. Um, so one for each fan and uh, one for the pump. Um, so you will want to make sure that your motherboard has enough fan headers to support that. Most motherboards have at least two or three, some have up to 10, um, but it differs a lot. Uh, so you're going to want to check the specs on your motherboard to make sure that you have enough free fan headers to plug in everything that your cooler comes with. Some coolers will come with, you know, some kind of like built-in fan hub or splitter, so you can check for that as well. Um, a good example would be uh, this Corsair cooler here uh, actually has its own fan header connectors, so you can plug these fans into the cooler itself, and then you don't have to worry about using up those extra headers, but not every cooler is like that. Because this cooler is software connected, as a lot of the higher end uh, coolers, especially coolers with RGB lighting are, this cooler also requires a USB header. Um, so this will take up a USB 2.0 header on your motherboard, so you're gonna wanna make sure that if you have a software connected cooler, that you have a free USB 2.0 header uh, to plug it into on your motherboard. Like I said, most motherboards are gonna have one or two of these at least. Um, if, you're, if you don't have any USB 2 ports on your case and you're not using some other kind of um, smart device in your system, you'll probably be okay, but something to double check on. And on the subject of RGB lighting, you may already have some lighting you know, ecosystem in your PC, uh, whether that's uh, plugged into the motherboard or it's run by some 
third-party brand, you know, uh, NZXT, Corsair, Thermaltake all have their own RGB ecosystems. So if you're already kind of bought into one of those ecosystems, it is another consideration if you're buying an RGB cooler or a cooler that's software connected, um, you know, that you don't want to have to run multiple pieces of software just to support two different types of lighting. It, you know, it's a little bit more convenient uh, to, to purchase into the same ecosystem. So like I said, if you have Corsair RGB fans already, um, then you probably want to look at getting a Corsair cooler to match that. Same thing if you have NZXT fans, NZXT cooler, Thermaltake fans, Thermaltake cooler, or any of the other brands that are out there. Um, for some lower end coolers that have RGB but don't have their own software, um, they may have a RGB header that plugs into the motherboard actually, uh, and the motherboard will dictate the color of the RGB lighting on the cooler. Um, that's how the one in the system is set up here. Um, for those ones, you don't have to worry as much, but you do again have to make sure that your motherboard has a free addressable or non-addressable RGB header. So generally take a look at what the connectivity of the cooler you're looking to purchase uh, looks like and make sure that you know your motherboard has all of those headers that everything can plug into. Well, thanks for tuning in. Hopefully you found this video helpful. Um, in the next video in the series, we're going to be covering the actual process of replacing the cooler, including the uninstallation of the previous cooler um, and the installation of the new cooler. Um, if we missed anything, you know, go ahead, feel free to get in touch with us. Uh, check us out on our Discord or our subreddit. Uh, if not, then I'll see you next time.